Fraser Muster just didn't accept barriers. Uh, barriers to knowledge, uh, barriers uh, to the uh, resource limits of, uh, of our country. Uh, he believed that it could be done uh, if you just worked hard enough at it and mobilized uh, people, and, and that's what he did. From the very beginning, Fraser Mustard has been a force, physically as well as intellectually. It was during the Second World War, so my father got me to join the Reserve Army at the age of 13. And I had my own gun crew by the age of 16. And so I was busy, I guess, directing 40-year-old plus males and in, in actual artillery work. We were using ancient guns from the First World War. We had the more modern guns at the end of the Second World War. So that, those, that sort of gave one a sense of confidence in what you could do. It allows you to develop your skills. I first met Fraser Mustard on the football field, and uh, meeting Fraser Mustard on the football field is like running headlong into a mountain. Uh, this uh, man was uh, physically larger than life. He had been uh, uh, in charge of a, what they call a chain gang, uh, the groups that uh, cut the, through the bush in surveying, uh, and he was tough as nails and absolutely enormous uh, in size and stature. After graduation from the University of Toronto in 1955, he needed a year of medical research before he could write the Royal College exams. At Cambridge, he decided to look at a basic but poorly understood process, how bleeding stops. He continued this research when he returned to Canada. Fraser Mustard really uh, opened up the life, uh, the biochemical life of the platelet, uh, helped uh, people understand that it was more than just a uh, partner in blood coagulation, but that it was a serious intermediary uh, in its actions uh, in the development of uh, atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease and strokes. And so uh, what he was able to do is open up a whole area of research that has now become fundamental in, uh, in uh, the understanding of particularly of vascular disease. At the time, he would have been, his laboratory in, in platelet physiology and biochemistry, uh, and also experimental pathology and thrombosis, would have been among the best two or three in the world. And he ran it himself. He raised the money himself. Uh, he was supported strongly by the, uh, what was then the Ontario Heart Foundation, it's now the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Um, I think, uh, I believe that had he stayed with it, because everyone grows with the field as the, uh, as the knowledge base and technology grows, he could have well got a Nobel Prize. In 1966, John Evans called with an invitation, come to Hamilton to help build a new faculty of medicine. The challenge proved irresistible, and the educational approach they and their team developed at McMaster has been adopted across North America. At that time, um, most of the other established medical schools in Canada thought we were crazy. Uh, it was problem-based learning, there were no examinations, uh, it was small group learning, uh, very few lectures. Our colleagues down the street at the U of T thought this was a bit risky and didn't like it, and it was only after it went through Harvard many years later that it eventually drifted to the U of T, but what one found when one was the Dean of Health Sciences that the sons and daughters of many of one's colleagues from Toronto actually come to McMaster to do the medical school program so that behind the scenes they really liked, at least their offsprings, really liked the program. Dr. Mustard became Dean of Medicine in 1972 and served in that position for a decade. But he was already thinking about applying the success of the McMaster approach on a much broader scale. After all, if you could break down barriers within a faculty so effectively, why couldn't you build an entire university without walls? One could see that the, the exponential growth of knowledge and the complexity of fields, and if you wanted to advance understanding in some of these fields, you needed to create programs that were not shackled down entirely by the institutional structures of universities and disciplines to move them. So we created the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and we use a fairly simple philosophy, perhaps build a little bit about the problem-solving mode of McMaster, that if you put together very talented people f 
from fields in which they do not necessarily interact and gave them the chance to do it in kind of a virtual organization, they might do some interesting things. And uh, the truth is, that's what they do. With the Institute successfully beginning a third decade of remarkable work, Fraser Mustard has now embarked on his fourth career, making himself a world expert on early childhood development. Life is too short to uh, give time of, to all the things that really interest him and, uh, and which he would passionately like to see solved. And early childhood uh, development is a classic. He was able to see the, the biological basis of uh, the early aspects of, uh, of development. He was able to see it within the, fra the social framework of what interfered with that uh, biological, what may, might determine uh, the uh, uh, intellectual and social development of, uh, of uh, children. He could put it together, and then the magic is he had the ability to sell it. His progression from world-class medical researcher through cutting-edge administrator and educator to scientific visionary has been truly remarkable and there's no end in sight. That's not surprising. Being 75 might be considered a barrier by some people, but Fraser Mustard doesn't accept barriers. If I look at my own career, I've avoided jobs. I've essentially tried to do things that I wanted to do and hopefully get support sufficient to do that. And so when you're geared up that way, you don't have a sense of retirement. You have a sense of keep doing things you can do if people would like you to do it, and you just keep working at it.